Hey friends, hope the morning's treating you well. Hope you got your coffee. I got my coffee. I'm out here on the porch and it is really, really hot. So I'm not sure how long I'll last. But, uh, you know, last week was the anniversary of Elvis's final concert. And that took place right here in Indianapolis. And I meant to talk about it and I completely forgot. So I'm going to talk about it this week. And um, Elvis played his final show right here at Market Square Arena in Indianapolis. And what made me think about it is a, a while back, I thought to look through old newspaper archives to try to find um, the review of that show and see what it was like. And I found it and I set it aside for when the anniversary came up and then I forgot to talk about it. So here I am. But I thought it would be fun if I read that review for you guys. Um, Elvis's final concert. This is in the Indianapolis Star, uh, Monday, June 27th, 1977. This is a review written by Rita Rose. And as a kid that grew up in Indiana, I don't know, I don't remember Rita Rose. I'm sad to admit that Zach Duncan was the guy that did all the concert reviews from uh, my formative years always was interested in everything Zach Duncan had to write but uh, it says Elvis performs in true Presley style before 18,000 um, by Rita Rose Elvis looks great and Elvis sounds great exclaimed comedian Jack Kahane to 18,000 enthusiastic sweaty palm fans at Market Square Arena last night uh, Jack Kahane it's spelled Kahane, and I didn't know how to pronounce that, so I got on uh, line and looked him up. And he's a comedian, and there's stuff um, on YouTube that I found of him, and I heard them pronounce his name, and I hope I'm remembering it right now. But um, also in his Wikipedia page, one of the first things it mentioned is that he opened for Elvis for a, a nice stretch of time. I think it was 72 to 77. And he um, said that one concert in Indianapolis, Jack Kahane was booed off the stage. Um, that's one of the first things that mentioned by people who were eager to hear Elvis. So they didn't want to put up with a comedian. And if you can imagine being a comedian to 18,000 people in an arena who were there to hear music, that would be a hard gig. It'd be hard to keep people's attention and it uh, sounds like Jack did not do so great on that night, but uh, maybe he did better on this night. But, um, and also, I'll continue. And also, Indianapolis once again prepared to greet royalty. The hip swiveling singer who has been called the king of rock and roll since the mid 1960s, Elvis. His name was everywhere on posters, buttons, souvenir books, t shirts hats and homemade clothes that proclaimed with personal touches admiration for a man idolized by millions this part here kind of kind of got me it says the big the big question was of course had he lost weight his last concert here nearly two years ago found elvis overweight sick and prone to give a lethargic performance as the lights in the arena were turned down after intermission, you could feel a silent plea ripping through the audience. Please, Elvis, don't be fat. That's kind of amazing to me to think of how much times have changed. Um, just openly fat shaming someone in a concert review. Um, it's, you forget what life was like. Can you imagine somebody in a major newspaper when uh, an artist comes touring through and, and they make a bunch of cracks about their weight? That would be a big, big deal. Now, I'm glad things have changed and, you know, people say things in their own homes amongst each other, but for it to be printed in a major newspaper um, and ridiculing somebody is a, a whole different thing. But uh, anyway, we'll continue. And then he appeared in a golden white jumpsuit and white boots, bounding on stage with energy that was a relief to everyone. At 42, Elvis is still carrying around some excess baggage on his midsection, 
but it doesn't stop him from giving a performance in true Presley style. His opening number, the audience grabbing CC Ryder, got his portion of the show off to a flashbulb popping, hand clapping start. Remember flashbulbs? Um, his Amen, in which he encouraged everyone to clap and sing along, seemed to bring everyone together, as did Jailhouse Rock and I Got a Woman. His older numbers seemed to draw more applause, although just about any, everything he did created mass hysteria especially his leg jerks. In case you have never seen Elvis, this particular maneuver consists of one singer standing perfectly still with his legs apart, then making said legs ripple like jelly, completing the action with moving <laughs> first one leg and then the other abruptly to each side, having to explain Elvis dance moves. Elvis has limited his karate movements, uh, but the stances he takes with his guitar generated screams and shrieks from delighted fans. During one number, he imitated J.D. Sumner's deep, rumbling voice, which was quite a treat. Sumner and his group, the Stamps, have traveled with Elvis for years, and their rapport was apparent as Elvis joked and made comments to them during the show. But J.D. Sumner, if I remember correctly, was in the Guinness Book of World's Records for producing the lowest audible sound from a human voice, like the lowest recorded sound, something like that. And I visited his grave, I think it was in Nashville, quite a while ago. I don't want to say what date because I might get it wrong, but it seems like it was a long time ago. But I have visited his grave. Of one of his best numbers we feel was It's Now or Never, followed by a medley of his hits. He also offered This Time You Gave Me a Mountain and Fairy Tale, plus several others. He also did his famous I, uh, uh, well, 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 well monologue, which seemed to turn Died in the Wool Elvis fans on. I'm, I'm guessing that's like an Elvis impersonation, but I'm not very good at it, so. Um, the, the coveted scars tossed into the audience after gracing the singer's neck. Elvis's motorcycle. The coveted scarves tossed into the audience after gracing the singer's neck caused mad scrambles by the stage as he got rid of them, just about as fast as they were put around his neck. The fans were well behaved considering the usual stampedes that take place at rock concerts. The first half of the show consisted of the usual stuff. The stamps singing uh, Jack Kahane with his Elvis jokes and the sweet inspirations in one song. But we'll mention them only briefly. We'll, but we'll mention them only briefly, since most fans just want to read about the king. The packed arena was indication enough that Elvis is still as popular as ever. Well, 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 well. And um, once again, that is that is Rita Rose from the June twenty seventh, nineteen seventy seven issue of the Indianapolis Star. It's a Monday, so Elvis's last concert was on a s Sunday night. Um, those of you, I'm sure this information's out there. I wish they would have said what his last song was. Like, what was the last song Elvis ever sang live in concert? I'm sure that info's out there because the El there are Elvis completists that are, you know, Elvis completists are out there. But I am. Um, as I'm looking through this newspaper thing here, I'm seeing a bunch of movie ads on the same page. And uh, <laughs> there are such movies as Rocky, who are in the theaters, uh, The Exorcist 2, A Bridge Too Far, um, Benji. There's a lot of, that's Airport 77. And um, also, I see concert listings for... Uh, stuff coming up. I see that Chicago is going to play at Market Square Arena uh, coming up. Tickets are six, seven, and eight dollars for that and um, it's reserved seating. So you can see Chicago at Market Square Arena for six, seven, or eight dollars and I'm thinking 1977 would be a pretty damn great time to see Chicago. But um, also, where did I find that? There it is. Ray Charles. 
Ray Charles is playing at Beef and Boards Dinner Theater. Beef and Boards was a pretty small place. I'm guessing they pro probably only held a few hundred people. And um, it would cost, there's two shows. He's playing there two nights. Two shows. You can see Ray Charles and have dinner for $15. He's got the Rayettes with him and the Ray Charles Orchestra. $15 for Ray Charles and dinner in an intimate venue. And um, there's a cocktail show also, I'm guessing, which is the later show. And that's $10 and you get some kind of cocktails with it for freaking Ray Charles, man. That's the one I would sign up for. And um, there was one other. Oh, yeah. At the uh, Indianapolis Convention Center, which was a pretty lousy, really bad sounding place for a show. But um, Boz Skaggs, Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes, and Ronnie Spector, all on one bill. And uh, reserve seating at $6.50 and $7.50 for Boz Skaggs, Southside Johnny, and Ronnie Spector. That's pretty damn all right. But, um, and up in the corner, there's some picture of Neil Diamond meeting Princess Margaret at London's Palladium. And I'm not really sure why that's in the Indianapolis Star, but um, I guess you got to cover up space or whatever. Uh, I don't know. Did you guys, any of you guys see Elvis there towards the end? Are Elvis fans out there? I know there has to be a few. I... The thing that these things pop up where I'll see these reviews and think I should probably talk about this someday, and a little time goes by and I forget about it. But what reminded me was I listen every now and then. Uh, there's Tony Kornheiser, I'm sure some of you know that is he's a sports guy, he was a sports writer, and um, I listen to his podcast every now and then, and it's mostly out of um, nostalgia. So when I planted trees for a living, I, got, I did that for 10 years, and I would listen to the radio during the day. This is before podcasting and uh, in YouTube, you know, I didn't have a phone. I didn't have any kind of a cell phone or anything. And um, I actually had one of those radios that had, um, you set it in the sun and it had some kind of a solar power thing or an antenna. And I would just listen to stuff on that radio when I was out away from the truck and carry that around with me. And you could crank it and it would, you know, charge it up for a few minutes. You'd have to crank it a hundred times during the day. I had one of those. And there was really not much on the radio to listen to. I would listen to NPR throughout most of the day. And I would go to listen to sports because I like sports. But I freaking hate sports talk. It's just so dumb. And um, Kornheiser had a radio show, like a sports talk show um, at that time. And he refused to, to interview athletes because he thought athletes were terrible interviews. And, you know, and they just have old sports writers on. And I liked it. You know, the guys that would be kids that would work with me, that um, would be like helpers, and they would be... I go into college and they would have the summer off so they'd come and you know work as a side job make a little extra money and sometimes you could see them talking about how yeah hey, maybe I'll quit college and do this or whatever and I kind of saw it as my duty to make them know that this is a crappy job and you do not want to do this for the rest of your life so I'd work them uh, a little bit hard sometimes and um, sometimes they'd be like can we not listen to this old guy you know, bitch about athletes all day or whatever. I said, you graduate college and you can listen to any damn thing you want to listen to. And um, so that was kind of, that was my little way of trying to make their lives better in the future, you know, help them work towards their future. All of this is said with humor. I hope that it's coming across that way. But, um, but I listened to Kornheiser. So I was listening to the other day. He has a podcast and... Uh, and he mentioned that he used to be a rock critic before he was a sports writer, like a long time ago when he was just getting started. And he reviewed one of Elvis's last concerts. And he absolutely loved Elvis. I mean, really, really loved Elvis. 
And then he went and saw Elvis, and he thought it was pretty terrible. So he wrote that it was, and he said, you'd never seen hatred, you know, as far as the letters that come back at you as the Elvis fans who believe that, you know, you just completely got it wrong. Elvis can do no wrong. And uh, it's kind of funny hearing him talk about that. So I thought about it and thought, I bet you his review of that concert is out there somewhere. So I got started looking through old newspaper archives. I found it. And um, I'm going to try to, if I can pull this up here, I'm going to try to read it to you guys. I think you guys might get a kick out of it. This is um, in Newsday. It's something in New York called Newsday. I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing that was a paper that he wrote for. Let me get a drink of coffee. I'm guessing that's a paper that he wrote for. But um, it says, it just says music. An aloof king by Tony Kornheiser. Relax, the king ain't dead yet. He's only sleeping. Elvis Presley brought his semi-annual photo session, scarf drop, and garage sale to the Nassau Coliseum for two shows Saturday. On sale in the lobby were giant Elvis scarves for $5, the brand new volume two Elvis photo albums for three, the suitable for framing Elvis posters for $2, and the Elvis buttons $1 on display on, display on stage was a lifelike Elvis suitable for ad adoring. I'm uh, fumbling a little bit of this because it's very hard to see the small lettering. But these prices, after I just said you could see, you know, Chicago on sale, or you can see Chicago play at Market Square Arena for $6. Elvis is selling scarves for $5. Just to show you how expensive that probably seemed to people. Singing, question mark? Who said anything about singing? Elvis did bits and pieces from 24 different songs Saturday night, running through most of them like his pants were on fire. On some of his greatest songs, like Love Me Tender, All Shook Up, Teddy Bear, Don't Be Cruel, and Hound Dog, Elvis hardly bothered to sing at all, preferring to talk and giggle away most of the words and walk around the stage, giving the sold-out crowd a better view to focus their cameras on. I guess Elvis figured that everybody knew the words anyway, so why waste his energy? Tony is pulling no punches. Only twice during his performance on the gospel number How Great Thou Art and on the semi-religious You'll Never Walk Alone did he let his voice all the way out, reaching back for the power and emotion that established him as the king of rock and roll almost 20 years ago. Both times he was magnificent. So magnificent that at once you realized how much he'd been cheating you with everything that had come before. Certainly the warm-up acts were a waste of time. Two vocal groups, uh, voice and the sweet inspirations were straight out of the synthetic soul Vegas handbook. The comedian Jackie Kahane not only wasn't funny, but he didn't even know where he was. He began with mare bean jokes. And he told us how glad he was to be back in his favorite city. I'm guessing that's the wrong city. Uh, the Coliseum is in Uniondale, which isn't even most people's favorite village. Of course, Elvis knew where he was. He was home. Everywhere he goes is home. The people love him, and Saturday Night's crowd loved him as much as any. They screamed and shrieked when he came on stage as his backup band played 2001. They called to him as, as he paraded around stage, bejeweled in glittering rhinestones, looking like a heavyweight wrestling champion with his giant belt buckle and regal suit, with his giant belt buckle and regal suit. Much has been written lately about how Elvis had turned to fat over the past f few years, but Elvis wasn't fat Saturday. He was overweight and over 39, like many in the audience, and it, at times he even looked foolish when he started shaking it, but he wasn't fat. Behind him on stage were 24 backup singers and musicians, including one man whose primary function was to drape different scarves around Elvis's neck so Elvis could demonstrate that he had worn them before 
and he dropped him to the frenzied people in the first few rows. Hardly a song went by without the scarf routine, and the closing song, I Can't Help Falling in Love with You, was in an orgy of scarfs. Maybe that was his final song ever in Indianapolis. There was no encore. After saying goodbye to the people and parading the stage one last time for one last flood of photos, Elvis ran from the stage and into a waiting limousine. He was out of the building before the house lights came up, leaving the people to file out of the Coliseum in awe of their fortune at having seen him. Yet there are two full generation of kids, those born in the late 50s and 60s, who are growing up wondering what this fuss is over Elvis is all about, what this fuss about Elvis is all about. Um, all they see are his Tinseltown movies on television. All they hear are his sanitized singles on radio. All they know is what their parents tell them. They'll never really feel the greasy electricity of his shakes or understand what was so special about a southern white boy singing black music through his hips. It's good to know we still have an Elvis, even if the Elvis we have has to be this one. That's Tony Kornheiser, um, one of Elvis's last shows. It's a pretty great... It's a pretty great piece of writing, I think, uh, as concert reviews go. Um, don't know if anybody's a Kornheiser fan. I guess he has a TV show. I don't know. I don't watch any of that, but um, I did enjoy his radio show back in the day. And I don't know. He probably wrote well about sports, too. But I've gone on for too long. Um, you guys like Elvis? Do you care about Elvis? Does... I realize time has gone on. Elvis was an important, important figure. Whether you like him or not, you can appreciate how important you know it is in the history of of rock and roll or music. I'm an Elvis fan, but I'm not that kind of Elvis fan. Like, cause some people, I'm not a fan of anybody. Like some people are fans of Elvis. It's not religion to me at all. I like listening to the Sun Records stuff. I like listening to that Memphis stuff with Reggie Young on it, and um, there's some other stuff that's uh, that's cool. Um, I, when people have asked what's your, what do you think the best Elvis performance is, which is really hard. I think of like a great performance as being something that like nobody else could do, nobody else could. Uh, do something that way and I think the I want you I need you I love you all of the vocal things that he does throughout that uh, ho 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 me you know and he has a little bit of the crooner in there all of those things I can't imagine another per another person singing it like that and Elvis is all in on that song and I really love that Elvis I love listening to that you know so that would be my choice if I had to pick a song. What would be yours? And um, I'm going to finish my coffee. I'm going to go inside because it is freaking hot. And uh, hopefully I will talk to you guys soon. And we will not talk about Elvis, I promise. But anyway, take care of each other. And much love to you.